Hello, welcome to Image Bearers. This is uh, Atoma Eji. We are up to uh, season three. This is episode five. Very fortunate today to have joining us today, Scott McKnight. He is uh, just a prolific author. He has either written or edited 75 books. And he's actually been a professor now for about three decades. I have a long list of his accomplishments, which I won't go into. We'll likely go over time if we did that. But I, I did find one that was pretty cool, which is he was elected into the Hall of Honor at Cornerstone University in honor of his basketball accomplishments during his college career. That's pretty awesome. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really funny. When people bring that up now, they just kind of laugh at me like, how could you have played basketball? But long, I grew up in a gymnasium. My father was a coach high school coach. My wife, uh, uh, we grew up together and her, her older brother was my hero. Uh, her younger brother was a, someone who pl I played basketball with a lot and her father was the athletic director at the high school. So. Okay. That's awesome. Sports, that's awesome. sports were a big part of my life. Yeah. So uh, we have also on with us, uh, Michael Burns, who is a prolific author uh, also has written a number of books and he's also uh, joined for the conversation today. So today is basically just dubbed a conversation with uh, Scott McKnight. So we have just a few questions about some of the books that uh, you've written, uh, just to kind of have like a little bit of a dialogue. And uh, definitely those of you who uh, are inspired by Scott McKnight, stick around to the end. We're going to uh, talk about one of the men that has influenced him greatly and get some perspective on perhaps how he would view the events of uh, our time right now. So I'm going to go ahead and start out with the uh, first question. So in your book, King Jesus Gospel, you mention obviously the gospel. Can you please explain a little bit about what the gospel is? I think uh, we've heard the term so much that, uh, you know, the question is, do we really know what it means? First of all, yeah. that's the first question. And the second question is, do you feel like a little bit of the predicament, the way, uh, where the church is right now? the evangelical church specifically is partly due to uh, an emphasis on the salvation culture rather than on the gospel culture. If so, can you explain? So kind of a two part question. Yeah, the, um, I grew up understanding the gospel as the four spiritual laws. This was the gospel preached in our church uh, in one shape or another. I'm not, the, the four spiritual laws existed at the time when I was a teen. Uh, but it basically, uh, the, the idea was to get people to feel guilty for the sins they've committed by preaching the law or by revealing uh, what, what sins they've committed, even though they don't want to admit it. There was an assumption that humans were unwilling to admit that they were sinners. And our goal was to persuade them that if they would just admit it, they could get through it and get saved. And so the whole idea was that God loves us. Uh, we're sinners. We're going to hell. Jesus died for our sins. If we receive him, we won't go to hell. That was the gospel that I grew up with. It was the gospel preached every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and sometimes even on Wednesday night, and certainly on Sunday nights at youth group meetings called Singspiration. That was the name of our youth group. Um, and I would say this is the gospel of Billy Graham. It's the gospel of most evangelical or evangelistic tracts. And it's uh, uh, what many people understand the gospel to be. Um, it was in uh, my own personal study of the New Testament, uh, in giving lectures, experiencing the significance of needing to follow Jesus that made me think that the gospel of just receiving Jesus into your heart was an inadequate expression of what the New Testament is actually calling people to do. My, I'm a big Dietrich Bonhoeffer fan, so I was always trying to press faith into discipleship. So, so it was more a call to discipleship. Uh, so I was really pushing hard on the proper response. It was in teaching college students at 8 o'clock in the morning, Jesus of Nazareth on Tuesdays and Thursdays for many years that I became convinced or I, I began to experience a number of students who were converted 
And I would say to myself, I, I didn't preach the gospel to them. They fell in love with Jesus. That provoked me to think about what the gospel is. It helped that Tom Wright was complaining about the evangelical gospel, that the gospel was not um, how to get saved, but it was a declaration of a message that Jesus is the King, the Messiah. And I was asked to give some lectures in different places, and I started putting together some stuff about the gospels, about what the gospel is. Finally, I was invited to uh, Ashland Theological Seminary by David De Silva, and I gave a series, I believe, of three or four lectures on just the gospel, and it turned into this book. The gospel, according to 1 Corinthians 15, which is an explicit statement of the gospel, the gospel according to 2 Timothy, the gospel according to the sermons in the book of Acts is a declaration that Jesus has arrived and he, in some sense, fulfills the long-awaited consummation of the story of Israel. So it is not a message of how to get saved so much as it is a message about who Jesus is. And if you get connected to this Jesus, you will get the salvation that he brings. So I just got an email. This is I was walking in the house before I got home, uh, or just a, few, a half hour ago, um, by someone who said, I agree with you that justification is not the gospel, it's the benefit of the gospel. And that is the way I would articulate it as well. So the gospel is to tell the story of Jesus. Tell people about Jesus. Whenever you're talking about Jesus, you are gospeling people. How's that, Otoma? That's, hey, well, you know. Is that an answer to your question? <laughs> I can't critique it. It's, it's awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess just the second part of that would be, you know, when, uh, when I review the evangelical world, and uh, I'm sure there's a ton of things I need to work on, but I think one of them that I, I'm thinking might be an issue is the salvation culture versus gospel culture. And uh, you talked a little bit about the gospel. And, and I guess, you know, I'm not sure your thoughts when you review the current uh, climate right now. Do you, do you think that the salvation culture is basically the, what's most prevalent? And what, what have been some of the problems that you can see with that, if you, if you agree with that? Well, okay, the first thing I wanna say, I'm a professor after all, we like to make fine points, you know, sometimes they don't matter, but we like to make them. And that is evangelical is a great big thing and it's uncontrollable and it's uncontrolled, it's bigger than anything we're talking about. So I would say uh, there are pockets of evangelicalism where the church is deconstructed by a gospel of pure, individual, personal relationship with God through Christ so that the church is deconstructed. And because the gospel has been framed as Jesus is the savior and therefore receive him and not Jesus is the Lord and therefore follow him, I would say that the gospel the four spiritual laws in the hands of many people has deconstructed the church even more because it's turned it into an individual message of salvation apart from the church and therefore it's it's a totally inadequate expression no thank you and i think with that it's it's we're maybe just touching the tip of the iceberg but i think as I've kind of wrestled with, you know, where things are at as, as, a, as, a, as a country, I think, you know, taking a step back and thinking, what are some of the solutions? I think one of them is a proper understanding of the gospel. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. not to get too much further into that, but I appreciate your, your point. And uh, perhaps we can unpack that another day in more detail. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to my good friend, Michael. He has a few questions uh, that he's composed also. Well, I, I do. And... Um... 
Mr. McKnight, can I call you Scott? Is that okay? That's my name. Uh, all right. So I, I have to tell you, I really appreciate, uh, so, you know, so many books that you've written. Uh, I'm a regular listener to Kingdom Roots. I, I love the podcast, so I, I appreciate well, thank that. Thank you. Well. Um, and just just kind of on a personal note at the beginning, is there, it, you know, what would you say that you do that's the most fun for you? Is it the podcast? Is it writing? Is it teaching in the classroom? I'm just kind of curious about that. You know, um, I love to teach. I love to write and study. I love to watch birds. I love to watch basketball games that are good. Uh, I like podcasts when they're people who are asking questions that really care about the questions, uh, you know, and sometimes radio interviews or people reading questions that they got from the publisher and haven't even looked at the book or taken it out of the box. So um, I'm a person who enjoys a lot of things. So I, I don't really have a preference. Okay, so all, all of the above, we'll take that. That's yeah, my fair. wife and I go for two walks a day. We walk oh, about 12,000 steps. We love doing that. So we like great. going to the restaurants in our hometown. We like going to church and being with our friends. And, you know, we love all those things. Amen. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Now, I got to tell you, I, I, I want to ask you a couple of questions that I do care about that I, I think that you've written so brilliantly about. I have to tell you, my my favorite book of yours is Reading Romans Backwards. And I, I'm not going to ask you any questions about that, because I feel like if we start talking about that, I might make you clear your schedule for the afternoon. Um, and I would just keep you for hours, because I absolutely love that book. Uh, super appreciate it. But um, I, I do want to ask you, in, in 2014, you wrote A Fellowship of Difference. And you kind of, you know, you explore God's grand mission to bring together people from across the globe, across cultures, socioeconomic groups, gender, race, and any other kind of difference we can come up with into one people. That call has, I think, taking, taken a new and, uh, you know, sort of exalted meaning in a, in a sense in this last year. And so what are some of the biggest challenges you see facing the church today in terms of race and the gathering of the nations and being a fellowship of differences? Well, uh, Michael, this is a big question and it is, uh, it is irresolvable. It, it's, it's insoluble, I think, in American culture right now. Uh, we are at war with one another and uh, everything is politicized so much that when we, you know, I was thinking, if I were to tell someone I'm against capital punishment, they say, are you a Democrat? Right. They don't ask, how do you make that as a decision morally? And so if I'm against racism, people are saying, you must be a social Democrat. You believe in Black Lives Matter. So all of a sudden, everything is politicized. And I'm, I want to diffuse that. But when I started teaching at Northern and started uh, focusing on the Apostle Paul more, uh, one of the things I wanted to do was say, I want you people to understand that Paul is speaking into our world right now with potent ideas, ideas that we are not practicing that have a chance to make a big difference. Paul's vision that in Christ, through the power of the Spirit, God's grace is operative in a way that brings together Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, in ways that the Roman Empire did not know. Aristotle's ma massively influential theory that um, of hierarchy and power, men superior to women, uh, slaves, born to be slaves, um, Jews and Greeks, you know, Aristotle would have seen Jews as fit for slavery, which he actually stated. So um, in that world of stereotyped hierarchies that generated so much of society, 
in status categories uh, is completely flipped by the Apostle Paul. So I believe that we have the potential in the gospel and in the church to deconstruct or to dismantle racist mentalities and create unity and equality and equity between peoples. All right, I believe that. I don't see this very often. The most equitable, equal society I have ever participated in were basketball teams mm. and football teams. Track teams in part, but it's so very individualistic. One of my high school teammates who was just a, a really brilliant sprinter is a pastor today. And we experienced unity of fellowship in ways that we could never have experienced any other way. So I think it's possible, but I don't see very many churches working to reconcile. I see churches obsessed with racism and systemic racism, and they love to talk about it. And I'm gonna give you my expression they love to feel good about feeling bad about their complicity in racism, but they're not doing anything about it other than blogging and tweeting and uh, maybe marching. We have a very serious race problem in the United States. The solution is not to sit around and feel bad about it, but to talk to these communities to find out what they need that will actually resolve the problems. We spend a whole lot more time blaming than we do uh, solving. So, but I believe the gospel has a chance to break into this culture and demonstrate to our society that race can be transcended in, in the church without minimizing the very important significance of diversity, let's say race, ethnicity, gender, all these things matter, you know? We're not trying to bring people, destroy their cultural context. We're trying to magnify their cultural context by transcending it in Christ and bringing people together. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. I appreciate that answer. That's very helpful and enlightening. And it kind of leads me into a, another question in a in a similar vein, and and, and I guess you know I, I I'm with you that I think the church uh, the way I kind of term it is is it can be an alternate society an alternate culture. Yeah, I, think that's I like that. Insane. And and you talk in a church called uh, Tove, you talk a lot about the culture of the church and creating a goodness culture within the church which i uh, really appreciate that book as well i just read it recently um so here, here's my question does the the body of christ in your opinion bear any responsibility to uh change the culture of the world because it seems like the world's going in the other direction from a culture mm. of goodness do, do we focus on ourselves or, you know, and bringing about that culture of goodness to emphasize the difference? Or do you think we have a responsibility to act for the life of the world and try to help the world change its culture? Um, so, so do we focus on the world or do we focus on our culture and become a, a totally different thing? Well, you know, John, John MacArthur has been spouting off about this kind of thing lately. And I think he, gets things messed up. And even when he says something right, it comes from the wrong context for me. So here, here's what I would say is, we need to learn to embody these, let's say justice, equity, freedom, liberty, whichever value you wanna talk about. I think we have to talk about a lot of these in the church. We need to uh, form characters um, we need to form behaviors and habits and embody these in a community in such a way that, that we get to know what it means to break down boundaries on race and gender 
et cetera, so that we live this out. But it's not a question of should we do it in the church or in society, although this is what's happened in the American evangelical church, is that it has become politicized so that it, it sees its primary role almost in changing society. Rather, I think we are far more wise if we learn to embody it as a church and through that embodiment, we become culture changers because we've learned the, the let's say the virtues of reconciliation so that when we enter the workplace or we enter our local community, or we enter the, the national or international uh, situations, we have learned what it means to be reconcilers, peacemakers, and learn how to transcend our differences and work together. So I believe that there is an order that we should work in the church and through the church into the world, but it's not because we're trying to change the world. It's because the world is being, evac let's say, the world is being erased in the church and the church enters the world to help the world see that its worldliness is not the way of God wow. and that we can help people move um, into realms of life that they didn't know before because we've experienced it. You know, my, uh, my best experiences with African-Americans, especially and Latin Americans, um, of course, Asian Americans, because they're so prevalent in the church is that uh, is believers in Christ, we have transcended our differences and it allows me to go into my culture and to see my neighbor behind who's an African-American and my next door neighbor who is a Mexican-American and say and see them in different colors because different colors, not a very good trope there, uh, see them in a different way because I've experienced that transcendence and reconciliation in my church. A lot of people have ideas, but have never embodied those ideas well enough to know the genuineness of lived theology. I know, Michael, you'll like that expression from <laughs> reading Romans backwards. But they haven't experienced the lived theology so that they can live it in context other than the church. That's, that's the way I would. I, I think that we make a mistake when, when our goal is to change society. I think we need to change ourselves so that we become agents of change in whatever context we're in. Amen. I appreciate. I, I couldn't agree with that more. I, I appreciate uh, every word of that answer. And I want to. I want to sneak one more question in here. Um, <clears throat> you have. You've written and talked a lot about the role of women in in the church and in Christianity and and that you know, that area of study. You've written about it some in Blue Parakeet, even uh, recently uh, on, on your podcast, you had a bit of that discussion with the author of uh, John Wayne, Jesus and John Wayne, and you guys yeah, got into yeah. that a little bit, um, which uh, a, a great book is as well. I appreciate you uh, covering that book on your, on your topic. Um, has your, since you wrote Blue Parakeet, has your um, thinking and the role of women changed or evolved at all? And, and where does the global church stand today in its discussion and practice in this topic as far as the inclusion of women in the life of the church? Well, thanks, Michael. Uh, I really appreciate all that you're reading of my stuff. You know what's going on in the blog. I'm, I'm going through William Witt right now, Icons of Christ. That is a really impressive book, too. And Beth Allison Barr is coming out soon. So um, I would say um, I'm always learning and growing. I think Lucy Pepiot pushing the buttons on 1 Corinthians 11, 1 to 16 has been a, a big growing experience for me. And um, I also think uh, that I'm beginning to see the systemic nature and the cultural nature of where women are in our churches. And I think people like uh, Kristen Kovas Dumay in her book demonstrates that, and Beth Allison Barr is doing this in her new book. They demonstrate that what many people today call complementarianism and thinking that this is the biblical view are very wide of the mark. And it's dangerous teaching 
to think that our cultural manifestations of 1950s and 60s, leave it to Beaver, Lassie, and Ozzy and Harriet. Now, you guys aren't old enough to know what I'm talking about here. Well, I but watched maybe... all those shows. Okay, okay. The, that is not what women were like in the first century, but that's what complementarianism means. And so these books are revealing something here that is uh, sharpening our tools. And, uh, and I'm growing from this. And I, I love learning about this topic. I have a colleague, Lynn Coick who has exposed uh, what women were like in the first century in Christianity, Judaism, Greco-Roman world. She's got a book on the second century that is really valuable as well. Those books are helping us understand that ancient context and the early Christian breaking of boundaries in ways that surprised, some ways that we think were a surprise weren't a surprise to anybody. Nobody was offended that Jesus was talking to women. But a lot of people like to say, oh man, they didn't talk to women at all. I don't know about that. Now there's some statements by rabbis, but statements by rabbis don't map very well on how people lived. For instance, we you may have grown up as I did that people who had leprosy couldn't be a part of society. And they had to say, I'm a leper, I'm a leper and stay away. But Jesus is touching lepers routinely and nobody seems to think that this is a problem. So lepers probably were a part of culture. And uh, the same goes with women were very much a part of culture and they participated in life. And uh, I think we need to get back to the first century to see some things. But I think there's some serious cracking of boundaries, exploding of the forces. On the international church, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to say that I think I know uh, what's going on. I, I think around the globe, there are lots of cultures that are hierarchical, uh, where women are subjected. Some of those cultures, the women are entirely happy, and our idea that they shouldn't be uh, is, not, is not very welcome. Um, and I think that we can help in those cultures, but we also need to realize colonialism is a dangerous game that we've played. We need to watch it. And uh, so I, I would say that there is growth in this area in many areas of the world, and there's non-growth in probably just as many, if not more areas. Amen, I appreciate that answer. One, one more really important question. Who's your favorite basketball team? NBA or, or yeah, let's go with the NBA. Okay. I'm not much of an NBA watcher, to be honest. I, I'm really enjoying watching Zion Williamson. I think it's amazing. Okay. That man's body and quickness and size and strength is really remarkable. Um, I've gotten kind of tired of LeBron. It's just you know, and not. I mean, he's a great basketball player, but there's a there's a sense in which they, they, they seem to feel entitled that they should win, and mm. I don't like that. I'm a bigger fan of NCAA basketball. Okay. Um, and I love, we love to watch the Big Ten. So we watch Illinois and we watch Northwestern. Not very good this year. We watch Iowa because Chris is my wife's brothers. Two of them played basketball at the University of Iowa. Uh, so, so we like to watch the Big Ten, Wisconsin. There you Eastern go. States, terrible. I was going to say you you were worrying me with your answer until you said Wisconsin. Now now I'm tracking with you. Well, man, I remember Dick Bennett and winning oh, yeah. 42 to 39. That's right. <laughs> but yeah, his that's son good. Tony is an awesome guy. He is down in Virginia. Yeah. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a Wisconsin guy. So Bucks, Badgers, all of that. So Packers. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's they're a lot better than the Bears. Yeah. <laughs> I thought they were the best team in football this year and they got beat. Look, they got beat by the best team. Yeah, well, there's always next year. All right, Atoma, I, I completely hijacked the interview. I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. No problem, no problem. I just have one last question and we'll wrap it up. So I just started listening to a, a few episodes of your uh, Kingdom Roots. So I listened to episode 13 and that's with uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who's one of your... Uh, 
who's had a major influence on your life. So can you share a little bit about what uh, inspires you about him? And also uh, perhaps what words you think he might have uh, to encourage at least pockets of the evangelical church today? Okay, let me say, I think uh, Bonhoeffer was Tove. You know, we haven't talked about Tove as much. Um, and he had the great character of goodness about him. Um, I began to read Dietrich Bonhoeffer when I was a sophomore in college, and I did not know what I was reading, but I knew I was in the world of a genius, of someone who had embodied the depth of discipleship that I, want, that I aspired to. So I began to read him in college and the first book I read was The Cost of Discipleship in a little Macmillan paperback with small print and terrible glue. So it fell apart, underlined things. And uh, then um, I got a book of his on ethics. I didn't have any idea what he was talking about, but I read it. And then I got uh, the letters and papers from prison and I read that and um, it was enjoyable, but at the same time, um, it was well beyond my theological education. When I went to seminary, um, none of my teachers ever talked about Dietrich Bonhoeffer at Trinity. This was in 1976 to 1980. When I came back to start teaching at Trinity in 1983 and teaching New Testament, eventually, I think it was probably about 1985, I taught a summer course on discipleship with Bon, uh, and I, I made Bonhoeffer's cost of discipleship the core of my lectures. And so I was able to return to that. But at the same time, I found life together. And Bonhoeffer has been with me since. And then when Germany started publishing his works uh, Auf Deutsch, I started subscribing to the books in German and then they started coming out in English in the final editions and I bought them all. And I have read uh, all 16 volumes twice. Um, and I've written a, a, a short article on Bonhoeffer and I've, I've often wanted to write about Bonhoeffer but I don't know enough about German history to be able to articulate his context in a way that's informed and I don't have any plans right now to study German history. So Bonhoeffer has become for me a, an exemplary theologian who struggled with his time in a way that was about discipleship in the context of church. I think he puts all of that together, discipleship in a context, in the context of a church. So a church shaped discipleship for a particular period in time. It's utterly brilliant. And um, I think he, he still speaks a lot uh, in discipleship and life together. I also think that his ethics, which I've read twice now uh, in the new edition, uh, presents some very serious challenges. And it's just a sad thing for me that he was murdered by Hitler and his minions and he didn't finish his ethics. Uh, you know, he was writing other things in prison, just didn't have the context to be able to develop his ethics. So Bonhoeffer has had a huge impact, but I, I really am serious when I say, I think he was a Tove man. He was a good man. He, he lived out the design of God for his life. He thought deeply, he pastored richly, um, he wrote with passion for topics that really matter to the actual life of Christians in a world where Christianity was challenged. So he, to use your uh, partner's term, he looked the, feet, the beast in the eyes and he defied the beast by saying, I'll follow Jesus, the way of the lamb over the way of the dragon. Uh, if he were to have words for the church today, what uh, what do you think he might say? Bonhoeffer? Yes, sir. 
Well, he still has words to say. He would say, uh, follow Jesus and you will learn by knowing who he is and listening to his words, what it means to follow Jesus in our particular context. I think he would be embarrassed by the American politicization of the church. I think he would be embarrassed by the superficiality and shallowness of mega church Christianity, which is driven by feel good ideas and felt needs rather than the cross and its image for life, the trope that it provides for us in living. And I think he would say your theologians are shallow. They get lost in games rather than the, the reality of what it means to be a Christ follower in our context, theologically and intellectually. How's that? It sounds like you need to partner with a uh, someone from uh, Germany who knows uh, history and write a book on on. <laughs> well, there's, on so many good books. there's so many good books on Bonhoeffer. I mean, I have, I literally have, I have three three feet of books of just his works in German and English, or more, and I have another three feet of books about Bonhoeffer, and uh, you know, I don't, I I learn from them. Maybe someday, but when I retire, maybe I'll retire to, to study Bonhoeffer for the rest of my life. So outside, what would, be, what would you say is the best biography that you've read on Bonhoeffer? There's only one great biography. It's by Eberhard Betke. It's his friend. Everything okay. else, everything else is uh, hors d'oeuvres. Okay. <laughs> All right. Speaking He's of, uh, I hear you. Speaking uh, of uh, food, I, I noticed that uh, you love to cook. What, uh, what are some of your favorite dishes you love to cook? <laughs> you guys are reading too much. Um, I, um, I love to cook risotto. Okay. I haven't made it for a, couple, for a year at least in a deep pan with our own stock. I learned about this in Italy and every, every restaurant, every ristorante, that we went to, I would try their risotto so that I would experience how different Italians make risotto. And I came back and I've tried them all. And uh, I just, I like risotto with porcini mushrooms. Uh, that's my favorite thing to cook, but I make omelets a couple times a week for us. And I'm the, uh, Chris buys the food and by and large, uh, I'm the cook. But I mean, we share that. That's awesome. All right. Well, don't want to take uh, too much more of your time. Yep. Definitely appreciate uh, everything. And I, I definitely look forward to getting into more of your Kingdom Roots uh, podcast and diving into uh, many more books. I did see that you posted on Twitter that uh, Reading Romans Backwards is uh, discounted. So I'll, I'll see. Maybe I'll see about picking that up. So yeah, very good. Very good. So what, how I'd, you I'd like to see enough of them sell that it could go into paperback. I hear so. you. I hear you. All right. Well, again, uh, if you guys enjoy, enjoy the episode, please consider subscribing and clicking like for more great episodes. Thanks so much for your time.